Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 118, William of Stratford, Part 2. He wears the rose of youth upon him. Last time, I looked at the life and times of John Shakespeare, Stratford businessman, glover and, at his height, chief alderman of the town. From that episode, there are a couple of corrections that I need to make, pointed out to me by listener John. I mentioned that after his time as a bailiff in 1568, John Shakespeare was not re-elected, and I suggested that this could be seen as an indication of his growing financial problems. In fact, the records show that no alderman was re-elected for the following year after his term of office, so this was not at all unusual, and the way that I linked those two things is not necessarily correct, and I'm happy to be corrected on that. The usual practice was in fact for the previous bailiff to become the next bailiff's deputy or high alderman, which makes perfect sense from a point of view of giving experience and continuity in these civic roles. And on another point, I placed the fire that burned a good portion of the town in September 1594. It was in fact in May that year. The narrative of John's life is perhaps not as simple as the failed businessman that had become the shorthand. For all that has been pieced together about him, the trail he leaves in the record is sketchy and we certainly don't have any recorded evidence about how he felt about his firstborn son's rise in the world of London theatre or any other of his life choices. There have been attempts to read Shakespeare's attitude to his father in how fathers are represented in the plays, but that is, I think, a rather slippery slope. It would be unreasonable to think that every father in every play represented Shakespeare's personal experience of or attitude towards his own father. But also, perfectly reasonable to think that there must be some comment driven by personal biography within the plays. How can we separate the two, the imaginative from the biographical? Personally, I think that's impossible. So it's time to move from John's story and take a look at his son's early years and an Elizabethan childhood. As with his father, we have to be honest up front and say that we know very little, in fact virtually nothing, of William's early life in Stratford. Beyond his christening, he doesn't turn up in any official records, and this is not at all surprising. However precocious he may or may not have been as a child, no one knew that he was to become such an important figure. Indeed, it would have been widely assumed that he would follow his father into the glover's trade and live out his life in Stratford but we can make some educated speculation about what his childhood was like. We know that John ran his gloving business and his sidelines from the family home. The workshop was the domain of John and his apprentices, and we believe involved cutting and sewing leather, as well as carrying out some elements of the tanning process. An opening with a shelf onto the street served as a shopfront to catch any passing trade interested in purchasing his gloves, but the main selling opportunities was Stratford's market held once a week. The living areas in the house were the female domain. John's wife Mary probably would have kept one or two maids to help with food preparation, household duties and childcare. That preparation of food was much more than just cooking. Plucking birds, gutting fish and preparing meat would probably have been undertaken outside to avoid too many noxious smells in the house and for easier disposal of waste. It's assumed that children, especially girls, were brought up to help in such tasks at an earlier age than is common now, and they probably fulfilled their share of childcare for younger siblings too. We can only assume that the Shakespeare's conformed to this standard pattern of an Elizabethan family set up, as their detailed domestic arrangements and John's low-level business activities leave no trace in the record. However, in the area of religion, because it was much more prescribed and better documented, we can be a little more sure about how life progressed. Children attended church, both the Sunday services and at times daily mass, matins and evensong. On holy days, of which there were many, all the shops and markets were shut. As I've mentioned before, church attendance was obligatory and defiance could result in extreme cases in excommunication, which implied social ostracism as well as the denial of the religious rites that were your path to heaven. This was serious stuff. From an early age, a knowledge of the word and actions of God was built up by the repetition of biblical stories, 
Bible quotations, and the Christian message generally. For the boys, catechism, the oral instruction and doctrines of the church, was taught by the local priest. This was a very regimented approach to the dispersal of the Word of God. Readings from the Bible, from 1568, that was the Bishop's Bible, revision of the earlier Great Bible of 1540, formed a core of the services. The Book of Common Prayer was the other guide for the services, prescribing prayers and readings for every day and occasion. Shakespeare's plays carry the proof of the depth and breadth of his familiarity with the Bible. They contain numerous quotations from and allusions to biblical texts, and it's said that these come from 42 books in the Bible, all but equally sourced from the Old and New Testament. The first three chapters of Genesis are particularly well represented in this way. We can't say if Shakespeare quoted from the Bible from memory, or how often he had to look up references, but because Bibles are some of the best preserved documents from the period, it's possible to see where he used later versions of the Bible and, in some cases, where he misquoted his source. Of course, we can't always see if those misquotes were intentional or an error of his memory. The plays also include quotes from and references to the Book of Common Prayer, suggesting a similar degree of immersion. All of which suggests that Shakespeare's upbringing was an orthodox Protestant one. There has been speculation about whether the Shakespeare family were recusants who held to the Catholic faith, or at least to some latent support for it. The fact is that there's no evidence of Shakespeare himself holding such feelings, and it's unlikely, as his profile rose in London, and if there was any concern about his religious leanings, that he would not have been investigated and, likely, some record of this would have survived. But again, there are no certainties here. Religion, you won't be surprised to hear, was completely mixed into the education system of the time. The 1599 decree by Queen Elizabeth concerning education specified that all teachers of children shall stir and move them to the love and due reverence of God's true religion, now truly set forth by public authority. We have to assume, of course, that in Stratford, the local school adhered to those specific rules. We don't have details of the school day from Stratford specifically, but there are plenty of records that suggest throughout the country that there was a good deal of conformity in the teaching of young boys, so we can make some assumptions here. The schoolroom in Stratford was in Church Street, behind the Guild Chapel, and not so far from the Shakespeare home in Henley Street. Education for boys started aged four or five at the Petty School, overseen by ushers rather than the official schoolmaster. The schoolboy's tool, called the hornbook, was a page of parchment in a wooden frame and covered with a thin layer of transparent horn. Exercises were scratched onto this device, starting with practising the alphabet and the basics of reading and writing. This then progressed to catechism and the reading of the Book of Common Prayer and the Bible. Devotional prayers were also taught, as was the use of a calendar and an almanac. This early education was in essence the beginning of the training in reading, writing and oration that would continue right through the educational system. As far as mathematics went, basic arithmetic was taught. After two years, pupils moved from the petty school to the attached grammar school. The grammar school at Stratford had been granted its charter in 1553, which allowed it one schoolmaster for a salary of £20 per annum, plus free accommodation in the schoolhouse. This is on the higher end of schoolmaster's remuneration for the time. There are plenty of examples of less well-paid teachers, but at Stratford, part of the master's salary was taken to pay the ushers in the petty school, so it's not quite as generous as it looks. Nevertheless, the masters at Stratford do appear to have been of good quality, by qualification at least, all of them being university graduates. The master during the time when Shakespeare would have been attending was one Thomas Jenkins, a graduate of Oxford University with a bachelor's and a master's degree, although he was of humble origins, being the son of a servant at the college. After he had taken holy orders, there were records that in 1575 the Stratford Town Council paid for the removal of his goods from Warwick, where he was a schoolmaster. He stayed in Stratford for four years before resigning in 1579. It's interesting to note that his younger brother was a Catholic missionary priest who was put to death in 1582 for his beliefs. 
It isn't clear if the schoolmaster's resignation is connected with his brother's activities. But some years later, he too acknowledged his Catholicism and paid the associated fines. So, although the school curriculum followed orthodoxy, who is to say that within the classroom there were not moments when Catholicism was surreptitiously acknowledged, perhaps even taught? When it comes to the change from Catholicism to Protestantism in England, the lines between acceptance, tolerance, and punishment changed forwards and back through the years, and at times they seem quite blurred. The school day was long, beginning at six or seven in the morning. Lessons were given until eleven o'clock, when there was a short break for breakfast. More lessons followed until a lunchtime break at one, and didn't finish until five or six in the evening. Attendance was for six days a week with few holidays. The main objective of the schools was to teach Latin grammar, although this was, of course, bookended at both ends of the day by prayer and other religious devotions. The authorised text for Latin grammar was William Lilly's short introduction to grammar, which set out the principles of Latin grammar in English and then continued with Latin conjugations entirely in Latin. The boys were taught to master Latin by rote learning, the continuous repetition of vocabulary, declensions and conjugations. Where Lilly's text gave the basics, other means had to be found to develop further Latin linguistic skills. There was a manual that gave examples of short sentences in Latin, and sayings with a moral flavour could be found in the works of Erasmus. Aesop was also used to further Latin skills, and was given a moral interpretation. Then they moved on to Terence, who was regarded as using very simple Latin, and then to Plautus, both being perhaps Shakespeare's first introduction to classical comedy. Moving on up through the years, the next introduction was to Latin moral poets, and perhaps, somewhat less entertainingly, students were expected to memorise parts of Latin dictionaries, and thus improve their vocabularies. They were set to translating passages from the Latin Bible, and works by biblical and philosophical commentators, that were considered appropriate for the time. Of this selection, only the works of Erasmus remain anywhere near well known today. And this was all still in the lower school. At about the age of 10, students moved to the upper school. As well as continuing Latin studies, students were taught rhetoric and the principles of logic. This involved reading Cicero, Quintilian, more Erasmus and others. The boys were eventually expected to compose their own thoughts and arguments. Poetry was also taught, but not so much for reasons of its aesthetic values, but as a way to sharpen the use of language and to improve comprehension. In essence, an understanding of the construction of poetry taught you how to choose words carefully and to use them with purpose. And so, the classic poets were introduced, Ovid, Virgil and Horace. Ovid was particularly well used in the schools, which may explain why he remained a favourite of Shakespeare's throughout his career. The latter years at school also included the teaching of Greek, where the Greek New Testament was used as a primary tool. Given this basic grammar school teaching, which sounds quite thorough to us, we might consider Johnson's criticism of Shakespeare that he had little Latin and less Greek as very harsh. But Johnson was making the point that Shakespeare was no university man, where all those skills would have been further increased and honed to a much greater degree but always with a view to the professions for which undergraduates were being trained, the church, medicine and law. In many respects, the grammar schools were doing the very hard work of instilling the basics into students and preparing them for university. But of course, we can never tell how far each individual student actually managed to master these skills. As we've already seen, Shakespeare's lack of university education was held against him, certainly by Robert Greene and probably by others in the university wit set too. But a university place was not open to all, and from Stratford at least, attendance at university was unusual. In the year of Shakespeare's birth, only one registered child can be traced to a university education, one William Smith, the younger son of Alderman Smith, a mercer and linen draper. There's a tradition that Shakespeare didn't complete his schooling due to his father's then straitened circumstances. This could be true, but also it could just be an extension of Johnson's comment about his reduced level of learning. 
Once again, there's no evidence either way. But what we can say for sure is that by the age of 15, if not before, Shakespeare would have been discharged from school. The most likely route for any son was to follow his father into his trade, and there are traditions that suggest this was indeed the case. Strangely, Aubrey, in his brief lives, records that Shakespeare's father was a butcher, and that his son did indeed work with him. He then continues about William. And I have been told herefore too by some of his neighbours, that when he was a boy, he exercised his father's trade. But when he killed a calf, he would do so in a high style, and make a great speech. This surely has to be a bit of a flight of fancy by Aubrey, who seems to want to believe that William showed off his innate talent at every opportunity. But Aubrey is often unreliable, and as far as I can see, there's no other serious belief in this story of John Shakespeare, the butcher. So, William, the glover's apprentice, is most likely. Again, we can only speculate about the degrees of reluctance or acceptance that he might have felt about this. Apprentice hours were long, and their lives were quite restricted apart from the one day a week reserved for rest and recreation. As I suggested last time, there were aspects of the glover's trade, the tail end of the tanning process, that a sensitive young man might have objected to. Many have speculated about how the son of the business owner might have been treated by other apprentices, or indeed by his father. No one seems to believe that John was indulgent, and most are inclined to believe that there must have been some sort of tension between father and oldest son. Tension caused by difficult financial times, or by differences in temperament, or a lack of willingness to buckle down to work where no enthusiasm could be found. You take your pick. Once again, all I can say is that we don't know anything of these personal circumstances, and the speculation largely seems to arise from a desire to explain how William's genius could have come from such lowly beginnings, and how he might have desired to escape from them. In that vein, there are some other traditions. One, that he was adopted into a family of a local scholarly gent seems particularly fanciful, with the idea that he worked as a tutor being perhaps more believable. But neither is attested by any evidence besides a long-standing tradition. It is essentially a romantic image of a young man bursting with ideas and creativity needing to escape from the out-of-the-way small town of Stratford. And speaking of romance, we know that this did happen for William, in some form, because he got married. But this too has been the subject of much speculation. We know that Anne Hathaway, the object of William's advances, lived in her family home at Shottery, a small village just a few miles from Stratford, certainly within walking distance for the time. She was the eldest daughter of a yeoman farmer and eight years William's senior, if the dates on her gravestone are correct. The farmhouse had a long life after she vacated it and now forms part of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. The way Anne's story has progressed through the centuries, how it has been used and misused within the Shakespeare mythology, is an interesting one in itself and one that I will return to on another occasion. But for now, let's stick to the known facts of Anne's life, which are very, very few. She was born in 1556 and the first mention of her in the record is in her father Richard's will from 1581, where he left her 10 marks, which is equated to something over £6, to be paid to her on the day of her marriage. In the will, Richard names her as Agnes, so perhaps this was a family or pet name for her. There are other examples of ladies christened or memorialised on gravestones as Anne being referred to in other places as Agnes. So there's little concern that Anne and Agnes are the same person. But we have absolute proof of this from the will of a shepherd who was a long-term employee of Anne's father. In his will, along with other bequests to his former employer's widow and children, he says, I give and bequeath unto the poor people of Stratford, that is in hand of Anne Shakespeare, wife unto Mr William Shakespeare, and is due debt unto me being paid to mine executor by the said William Shakespeare or his assignees according to the true meaning of this my will. The Hathaways were a well-off farming family. Their home, now referred to as Anne Hathaway's Cottage, was in fact a substantial 12-room family home set in its own lands on the edge of the Forest of Arden. This was a family of some means. 
We next hear of Anne in relation to her marriage to William in November 1582. She gave birth to their first child six months later, and it is because of that fact, and the age difference between bride and groom, that some have assumed that the wedding was forced on William, a shotgun wedding, with the affronted bride's relations forcing the young man up the aisle. But there is no clear evidence of this, and things were almost certainly more nuanced than that scenario suggests. At the time, there was no legal requirement for a marriage certificate, as we would understand it today. The normal rules of the church were that prior to a wedding, the wedding bands, announcing the couple's intention to wed, had to be read out as part of a church service on three preceding occasions, Sundays or Holy Days. This was usually undertaken in the bride's parish church. Thereby, everybody local was aware of the impending matrimony and there was an opportunity to bring any objections to the priest or, I suppose, to confront the individuals directly. Once the marriage ceremony had taken place, Details were entered into the parish register and the job was done. However, in William and Anne's case, special permission was needed. William, at 18, was still a minor, which may have played into this, but it was probably Anne's condition that meant swift action was required. The reading of marriage bans was prohibited on several dates before and during Advent in the lead-up to Christmas, and for almost all of the month of January. For some reason, the couple missed the dates that were available. Again, a reluctance on William's part to wed is often speculated on. And the only way to procure the necessary permissions was to get a special permission from the bishop's court in Worcester. Two friends of the Hathaway family travelled there on the 27th of November, possibly with William in tow. And armed with sworn statements from the parents and other local notables who confirmed no objection to the union and the reasons for the special dispensation. This type of requirement was not at all unusual, and for a fee of a few shillings, and with conditions attached about the reading of the bands in a reduced form, in some cases even at the door of the church immediately before the marriage ceremony, permission to marry was usually granted. Sadly, none of this associated documentation that would have told us a fuller story survive. Nor does the granted licence that was presumably taken to the priest who was to perform the ceremony and kept by him in case of any issues that might arise in the future, arse safely covered by the authority of a bishop. The document we do have, the entry into the bishop's register, simply records that William Shakespeare and the maiden Anne Hathaway of Stratford in the Diocese of Worcester could marry, and that they had the consent of the bride's family to do so, and therefore live as man and wife. The requirement was for just one reading of the bans and the affirmation that there were no obstacles to the marriage, such as pre-contract, consanguinity or the like. The bishop and his appointees then covered themselves by adding that should the validity of the union be later impeached, then a bond of £40 posted by the two sureties would be forfeited, to save harmless the Right Reverend Father of God, Lord John, Bishop of Worcester, and his offices. Now, £40 was quite a sum, suggesting that the Hathaway relatives were not doing this lightly and had some confidence in the young William. Also, it's interesting that Anne is referred to as Maiden, which she certainly was not. It's unlikely that she would have travelled to Worcester with the men, so either there was an agreement between those who wrote the statements of support, not to mention her condition, or perhaps a suitable inducement was passed to the bishop's representative to gloss over the matter. Some have considered it significant that John Shakespeare was not present, suggesting perhaps disagreement between the families and the idea that the Hathaways had taken control, leaving William little option in the matter. However, whatever the reasons for John's absence, it seems clear that if he did object, he could easily have done so, himself or through a representative, and scotched the whole affair. That is, of course, in all of this, no real suggestion of anything unusual for the time. Indeed, given the inheritance rules that were current, it was the bride's family who had most self-interest in ensuring that the legal and religious niceties were followed correctly and family wealth protected from a potential fortune hunter of a bridegroom. It is another record that gives rise to one of the greatest conundrums about William and Anne's marriage. Following the entry of the licence on the 27th of November 1582, 
The clerk of the court made a record of it, where he records the bride's name as Anne Waitley of Temple Grafton. This single entry, and it is the only reference anyone has ever found to Anne Waitley, has led to thousands of words in Shakespeare biographies, become the basis of tens of novels and hundreds of speculative thoughts on how William may have been embroiled with two women and what events might have transpired for this second Anne to become recorded in the legal register. I'm not going to attempt to document all of that here because I wouldn't have enough time, and however entertaining these thoughts might be, they are pure speculation. Enough to say that they range from painting William as a lusty youth who couldn't keep it in his pants, to the idea that perhaps there was another William Shakespeare, resident of Stratford, who just happened to be at the bishop's court seeking a marriage licence on the same day as the future playwright. There are also some very much less speculative suggestions. The records written by the clerk of the court have been studied and on several occasions it's noted that he confused names between different entries or simply got something wrong, although swapping Hathaway for Waitley seems more than just a slip of the pen in a rushed moment. On the day that he was dealing with William and Anne's application, he recorded 39 other rulings, one of which concerned William Waitley, vicar of Crowell, who was suing for non-payment of tithes. That vicar was involved in several cases at court at the time, so perhaps his name was a little more familiar to the clerk than the others he dealt with on the day, and it got into the record by his error. But also, why Temple Grafton? Why not Chottery as the bride's home? There seems to be no good explanation for this, other than, as the villages are only three miles apart, perhaps the Hathaway family owned or farmed lands there, and might have had a house there. Or perhaps this was where the couple planned to marry, as it was a quieter church, if indeed it was a quieter wedding that all concerned desired. The priest at Temple Grafton was recorded in the bishop's records as old and unreliable, probably meaning that he had displayed Catholic sympathies at some point, so perhaps he was a good bet for performing a hastily arranged marriage under a very recently acquired licence. Once again, this is all speculation, as the parish records from Temple Grafton are far from complete, and this particular reference continues to be a bit of a mystery. Research in the local records has shown that pregnant brides were not at all uncommon, and William and Anne were quite likely following a well-trodden path in Elizabethan England. It's possible that they considered themselves joined even before they were married in church. The concept of the troth plight had a long history and was taken as a serious commitment between a couple. Once a couple were known to have promised themselves to each other, even without the official blessing of the church, any subsequent breakup carried at the very least some social stigma and at worst ostracism. Although the church officially held out for no sex before marriage, within society a collective blind eye could be turned to couples engaging in such business after they had plighted their troth. The tradition is also represented in the similar idea of a hand-fasting ceremony, which in some European culture was regarded as an unofficial wedding. The term could originate from Germanic or Old Norse, suggesting that the tradition had been around for a very long time, even before the early modern period. Church weddings had been made a requirement in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council, but hand fasting had been retained as an unofficial ceremony that came to be performed about a month before the church wedding. But again, this was no temporary arrangement that could be easily broken. As with the troth plight, after the hand-fasting ceremony, the couple were as good as married in the eyes of their fellow villagers or townsfolk, and it seems entirely reasonable to assume that a couple would have found somewhere private to take advantage of that fact. Further details of William and Anne's marriage are not known, but most likely, given the rush for the licence, it was on the 26th of November 1582, or very shortly thereafter. What we can say for certain is that on Sunday the 26th of May 1563, William and Anne's first daughter was christened at the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford. No doubt a happy event for them and both their families, whatever the circumstances of their marriage. So there we have something of the forming of the man. Shakespeare's education undoubtedly gave him a grounding that is reflected in his plays. There are many mentions of the schoolroom, and references to lessons learned there, 
And Shakespeare could make those references, presumably because he knew that anyone who had been through the grammar school system would have had a very similar experience to his own. But it was just a building block, necessary, but not perhaps the root of his genius. As far as the story of William and Anne's marriage goes, I think, while not wanting to denigrate the entertainment value of some of the stories that have been crafted around the lack of evidence, it's best to agree with Francis Bacon, who said that all the speculations were labourous webs of learning spun out of no great quantity of matter and infinite agitation of wit. I've tried to avoid speculation here, which is difficult given the amount written about William and Anne's marriage and private life. But to conclude, perhaps allow me just one moment. I came across this suggestion from Shakespeare and English Renaissance theatre scholar Andrew Gurr, Emeritus Professor of English at Reading University. He notes that Sonnet 145 is a bit of an outlier. It is generally considered to be one of Shakespeare's slightest poems, being linguistically very simple, and it has the ring of youthful poetry about it. It is of an amorous tone, and although it sits in the Dark Lady sequence as it has been traditionally placed, it doesn't sit very comfortably there. It is the only poem not in iambic pentameter and is more descriptive than those placed near it. The conceit is that a man is so in love with a woman that when he hears that she hates something, he is struck with fear that she is referring to him. But she realises the pain she has caused him, changes the way she expresses herself and assures him that although she may hate, she doesn't hate him. The last couplet could, Gurr suggests, contain a pun on the name Hathaway, especially if it's said in a Worcester accent of the time, which also makes the rhyming scheme work better. Back in the day, he suggests, the last line that starts, and saved my life, would have been pronounced exactly the same as, and saved my life. After I sign off, I'll leave you with that poem giving you both variations and the thought that it could be Shakespeare's earliest known poem, and a young man's love poem to his intended. Next time, the Shakespeare biography continues with William and Anne's growing family and the infamous Lost Years. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group, or find a podcast on Instagram or X just to keep up to date with new episodes and other theatre-related stuff. If you do feel able to help out with the costs of running the podcast, then please head over to Patreon, where you will find additional content for a small monthly fee or a one-off donation. I have started on new Patreon episodes relating to this season, the first being all about the criticism and appreciation of Shakespeare through the centuries. So, if you've been thinking about it for a while, now would be a perfect time to sign up. You can find details of the ways to support the podcast at the website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via x at thoetp. And now, Sonnet 145, Those Lips That Love's Own Hand Did Make Those lips that love's own hand did make breathed forth the sound that said, I hate. To me, that languished for her sake. But when she saw my woeful state, straight in her heart did mercy come, chiding that tongue that ever sweet was used in giving gentle doom and taught it thus anew to greet, I hate she altered, with an end that followed it as gentle day doth follow night, who, like a fiend, from heaven to hell is flown away. I hate, from hate away she threw, and saved my life, saying, Not you. Or perhaps, I hate, from Hathaway she threw, and saved my life, saying, Not you. Thank mm-hmm. you.